This aircraft was the only long-range heavy bomber used by the German Air Force during World War II. At the beginning of its development, it was a very advanced design, but continuous problems, constant changes in the requirements, and the changes in the design delayed its enter to service. By the time the problems were fixed, Germany was on the defense, and the great effort put in these heavy bombers in the end didn't affect the outcome of the war. So let's see the history of the Heinkel 177 and what problems and decisions caused it to be a failed project instead of a war-winning weapon. During the early and mid-1930s, the German Army and Air Force initiated big development and rearming programs, first in secret, then later openly after Germany denounced the Versailles Treaty. Many of the aircrafts that later became well known in World War II were designed in this period of time. The Ju-87 Stuka, the Heinkel HG-111 bomber, and the famous Messerschmitt Bf-109 both started development in the mid-1930s. Many of them saw combat as a trial in the Spanish Civil War, which gave the Germans a lot of valuable experience, but also cemented the view that the Air Force should mainly be used in tactical role, supporting the army, rather than strategically. A view which greatly hampered the heavy bomber designs. Before the Spanish Civil War, a long-range heavy bomber concept was laid out. The main advocate of the heavy bombers was General Walter Weaver, the chief of staff of the Luftwaffe. In 1936, the RLM issued specifications to Dornier and Junkers for the so-called Ural bomber, aimed to create heavy long-range bombers that could reach deep into the Soviet Union. Dornier entered the DO-19 design and Junkers the Ju-89, and the RLM ordered prototypes from both aircrafts. Both of them were designed to carry a bomb load of 1600 kg to a range of around 2000 km. Both of the designs turned out to be underpowered and troublesome, and even before the prototypes could take flight, General Weaver died in an unfortunate plane crash, and the heavy bomber project lost its main supporter. The same time the experiences from the Spanish Civil War resulted in the widespread opinion that tactical use and dive bombing is the way forward. The Ural bomber project was cancelled in April 1937. But the German heavy bomber project was not yet dead. Before the accident, General Weber still pressed for new designs for the heavy bomber project, and the RLM just a day before his accident notified several companies to start designing a new heavy bomber, with much more ambitious requirements than the Ural bombers. This was the so-called Bomber A project, and the requirements were at least 500 km an hour maximum speed and 5000 km of range. The capability to carry larger bombs was also a requirement. Heinkel entered with their Project 1041. The required speed was a big challenge for the designers, but luckily Heinkel had experience how to reduce drag in their designs, and they built an experimental aircraft not long before, which helped them in designing their new bomber. The HE-119 was a very streamlined aircraft, and used a dual engine setup, where two Daimler DB601 engines were mounted side by side, driving a single propeller. To achieve the high speed for a heavy bomber and reduce drag, Heinkel opted for only two engines instead of four, but that required at least 2000 horsepower engines. At that time there were no engines powerful enough, so it was decided to use a similar power system as on the HG-119 and mount a pair of engines in a single nacelle on each wing. To further improve aerodynamics, the designers used evaporative cooling to avoid using big surface radiators and adding drag. But later it was found this cooling system will not be able to deal with the large amount of heat from the power system, and conventional radiators were fitted instead. The design also had a stepless cockpit, similarly to the late model HG-111 bombers, and to reduce weight they planned to use remote control turrets as defensive armament. But the development of the remote control turrets was very slow, and the aircraft eventually was equipped with conventional man turrets, and only late models received a remote dorsal turret. Because of the conventional turrets, the aircraft ended up waiting more than originally planned. We can already see the very ambitious requirements and high-tech design caused difficulties during the development, but above all of this, the politics started to play a role as well. 
As we mentioned at that time, there was a strong opinion in the Luftwaffe that the bombers should be used in tactical roles. Also, the experiences in the Spanish Civil War showed that the early German bomb sites were not very accurate, and dive bombers got much better results. Because of that, basically every bomber type in development was required to be able to perform dive bombing as well. Just when the full-sized mock-up of the HG-177 was ready in November 1937, the RLM notified Heinkel that the aircraft needs to be able to perform shallow dive attacks. This required strengthening the frame, which meant further weight increase for the aircraft. But not long after that was done, the RLM notified Heinkel on further demands. Now the aircraft needed to be capable of 60 degree dive attacks. This led to further redesigns and weight increase. The constant redesigns led to so much weight increase that now the original undercarriage couldn't handle the weight of the aircraft, which increased to 32 tons loaded. So the undercarriage had to be redesigned as well. A dual wheel design was used, where the two wheel legs retracted on the two sides of the engine nacelles. Of course adding a dual landing gear again increased the weight of the bomber. In November 1938, the RLM ordered the first prototype to be built, and not long after the number was raised to six aircrafts. While the work went on the prototypes, the power plants became the problem, as the RLM didn't order them in time from Daimler, and even other options were considered. A similar coupled power plant using UMO 211 engines, four traditional engines, or BMW radial air cooled engines. But in the end, all alternative solutions were dropped. The maiden flight happened a year later, in November 1939, and the aircraft handled well, but the flight was cut short, as after only 20 minutes it had to land because both engines overheated. A gloomy sight of what was to come later. The engine overheating and fires followed the HG-177 during its lifetime, thanks to the extremely tight engine nacelles around the power plants and other design problems. The prototype showed several other faults in the design and in its intended use. The V2 prototype disintegrated during a dive, and later the V4 failed to recover from a dive and crashed into the Baltic Sea. During the test flights, many changes were implemented in the aircraft. The first eight prototypes were built with a circular fuselage, while beginning with the A0 pre-production series, the sides were more flat and angular. After the initial eight prototypes, 35 pre-production aircrafts were completed, followed by 130 A1 production variants, and then 642 A3 variants, which introduced the second dorsal turret. The final A5 variant had a production run of 350 units. During its lifetime, several different weapon and turret types were tested on the bomber as well. There were ideas to use it as an attack aircraft, and different heavy weaponry was tested, such as forward firing dual 30mm cannons, 50mm cannons, and even a 75mm anti-tank weapon. In parallel, different tail gunner positions were tested, from single to dual, and even quad machine gun mounts. Beginning in 1943, after a big redesign, all of them were built with a 1.6 meter longer fuselage to help with stability, and redesigned engine nacelles and exhaust to help with the engine overheating and fires. Because of the problems with the coupled engine design and its availability, Heinkel requested the RLM to allow building a four-engine version with conventional design as early as 1938, but his request was ignored at that time. But finally in 1942, the dive bombing requirements were lifted from the HG-177, so the work on the four-engine design could finally go on. Apparently Hermann Göring didn't know about the HG-177 using the coupled engine design, and was under the impression it was gonna be a conventional four-engine bomber. So in 1942 he personally intervened, and stated the diving ability is not needed for this aircraft. The new four-engine design was named HG-177B. Three prototypes were built, and one of them, the V-102, was modified with a dual tail design. The test flights for the new four-engine aircraft started in December 1943, and they were planned to start production later in 1944. But because of the intensifying Allied bombing raids and the introduction of the emergency fighter program, which allocated most resources for fighter production, this never happened.
the Heiji 177 was comparable in size and weight to the B-17 bomber. With a length of 22 meters and a wingspan of 31.44 meters. The bomber's empty weight was 16,800 kg and its maximum takeoff weight was 32,000 kg. It was powered by two Daimler DB610 24 cylinder engines producing 3,000 horsepower each. Its maximum speed was 488 km an hour and the cruise speed was 415 km an hour. The bomber's maximum range was 6,000 km with a service ceiling of 8,000 meters. The defensive armament usually consisted of one 7.92 mm machine gun in the nose, one 20 mm cannon under the nose and one 20 mm in the tail. The turrets featured four 13 mm machine guns. The maximum bomb load was 7000 kg internally or 2500 kg externally, but the usual loadout was around 5000 kg. The bomber was able to carry 1000 kg and 1800 kg bombs, torpedoes, and was also able to carry three of the Fritz X bombs or three of the HS 293 guided missiles. The HE-177 entered service in 1942, but it still had many problems at that time. The engines had a tendency to overheat, and the hot exhaust sometimes had the oil accumulated in the nacelles on fire, and the wings again needed another redesign. In 1943, they were deployed to carry supply drops to the German 6th Army, which was surrounded at Stalingrad. But as it turned out, the HE-177 could only carry about the same amount of cargo as the smaller HE-111, but the new bombers had engine problems and sometimes they just burst into flames in the air, which resulted in several of them lost during this time. The plane's constant problems and the need for highly trained maintenance crews and the complicated design resulted in them sitting at airfields most of the time, but still they participated in combat operations. One of these was Operation Steinbock, a German bombing offensive against southern Britain in 1944. The HG-177s, together with other German bombers, started flying missions against London in January 1944. While the operation was a failure, with many German bombers lost, it showed the usefulness of the 177, as with its speed advantage compared to other bombers, it was not an easy target for Allied fighters. It also showed, however, the unreliability of these planes. Only four of them were lost to enemy fire, but on some missions more than half of them had to return to base because of engine problems. They were also planned to be used in long-range anti-shipping role, carrying torpedoes or the newest German guided weapons, the guided anti-ship bomb, the Fritz X, and the HS-293 anti-ship guided missile. The HS-293 was a radio-controlled missile, launched from 3 to 5 km distance and guided from the aircraft to the target. For the operator to be able to track them, they carried flares for better visibility. For this role, a flying external fuel tank was designed to improve the operational range. They also flew bombing missions on the Eastern Front, where the high-flying fast bombers were relatively safe from the Soviet Air Force, who were used to low-level combat. There were some occasions when they were used at low levels to bomb the attacking Soviet forces, but these bombing runs resulted in high losses. The HG-177 was again a German aircraft that was a victim of its too complicated design and the sometimes strange requirements set by the RLM and the Luftwaffe. By the time its problems were fixed, and it was available in numbers, the Germans were hit by fuel shortage, and the German Air Force was on the defensive, so a long-range strategic bomber was not much use. If these bombers would have been available earlier and in numbers, they could have had a great effect during the Blitz against Britain and the British shipping. This bomber was much faster and had a bigger payload than any other German design, so its effect early in the war could have been devastating. But instead this bomber used up a huge amount of resources and development time, which the Germans could have directed to other designs. If we just think about that around 1100 Heinkel 177s were manufactured, and all of them used up four Daimler engines, meaning from the materials used for these accident prone bombers, the Germans could have built more than 4500 fighter planes. So instead of greatly affecting the war early on in favor of the Germans, this bomber was a factor of them losing, basically because of one thing 
the obsession with dive bombing in the Luftwaffe in the late 1930s. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please leave a like, subscribe to my channel and in the comments let me know if there's any interesting events or vehicles you'd like to see.